Australia, over half of the people live in cities. Children are within easy reach of all kinds of schools. It's a hop, skip and a jump from home to kindergarten and public school. From there they can go on to secondary, technical and high schools provided by the state. And beyond the school gates are the quiet cloisters of the university, with students in every branch of learning. But not every child lives in the city. There are thousands who look out on sheep country, children of prospectors and linesmen, fishermen and farmers whose next door neighbour is a mile or more down the road. There are schools for these children too. Often a little bush school where one teacher looks after five or more children of varying ages. Further away still are the children of the art back. Here, homesteads grow singly between the hills and children live too far apart to justify even a one teacher school. Yet living all their lives in the country, these children are wise in the ways of the land. They know the tides and traffic of the sea. Helping their parents in the work of the farm is an education in itself. And though it's not possible for them to go to an ordinary school, their formal education is not forgotten by the state education departments. In the capital city of each state is a school where there are no pupils, only teachers. These are the correspondence schools operated by state governments, where children are taught by post. The teachers have the same qualifications as those in any state school. For the same hours every day, they take classes in primary and secondary education. But there's one difference. Few of them have seen their pupils. Few of the pupils have ever seen their teachers. Yet, through the mailbag, these children of the outback receive the same free education as the children who live in cities. From learning to read, they go on to learn by reading. The basis of the correspondence method is the instruction leaflet. These leaflets are prepared from living sources by teachers in the school, a separate set to cover each subject in the curriculum. The information they contain is detailed, since children in the bush haven't the same access to libraries and books. The finished leaflets are approved by the headmaster. Stocks of several hundred different leaflets printed by the government printer are kept in the school store until they are needed in the classroom. Instructions to supervisors and a summary of the work to be done each week are stenciled. There are also special leaflets to be run off on subjects taken by only a few pupils. As the teacher makes up the regular package, she selects the appropriate leaflets for the next stage in the pupil's development. Because of individual tuition, the pupil is able to advance at his own pace, so there's a separate set of leaflets for each envelope. School magazines are also sent once a month to correspondence pupils, and there's a stamped envelope for return of completed lessons. Postage on books and letters is paid both ways by the education department but it's more than an impersonal dispatch of printed matter. Teachers feel they know every child personally. They've exchanged letters with parents and have become almost a member of the family themselves. Into the mailbag go the letters, from classroom to post office. Letters for immediate dispatch to catch the post for places on the map where the mailman calls only once a week. by train from central to country stations on the branch lines. By plane, 
over the broad backs of the ranges to the inland plains. From each of the six capital cities, mail goes to over 18,000 children scattered in the remote parts of the continent. The lines push inward from the coast, from Sydney, Melbourne, from Perth and Hobart, from Adelaide in South Australia as far as Alice Springs, from Brisbane to Cape York and the Pacific Islands. It may finish its journey by bicycle in Queensland at one of the dairy farms of Tuong. Planes landed on the desert runways of the Northern Territory, where children from the cattle stations and the Wolfram mines are waiting. In the more remote parts of Western Australia, Camel trains carry it over the tracks of the gold rush and the deserted hunting grounds of the Aborigines. The buggy is still used back in the hills of Victoria and over the border to the sheep stations at Ross Common in New South Wales. Before the truck is halfway down the hill, the children hear it. There's a race to the mailbox where they've hung out a signal for the mailman to stop. That means there are finished lessons to be picked up and a letter from the correspondence school is expected. In their homes, the children work at their lessons during regular school hours. We go back to school on Tuesday, they say after a holiday, even though school is just a table in the garden. But it's still school, with weekends free, and the same working hours and vacations that other children get. Education is not compulsory for children living further than three miles from a school, but more and more parents are anxious for their children to learn about the world they live in and they enrol them voluntarily as correspondence pupils. Home isn't like a classroom, and children must learn to study by themselves. That's not easy when the sun's shining, and there are so many interesting things happening all around them. It's no wonder their attention wanders sometimes. Richard, get on with your work. It's the job of the supervisor to see that children stick to their work and understand their lessons. Sometimes the family can engage a governess, or there's an elder child to help the young ones. But usually it's the mother who adds this responsibility to all her other work about the house. Often it means learning the lessons herself before she can explain them to the child. Always means an extra burden, 
but parents are so eager for their children to receive the best possible education that they willingly work hard and overcome all obstacles to ensure it. Many of the correspondence pupils are taking an elementary course. They're learning to write and build words and to illustrate their stories with original drawings. There are problems in simple arithmetic to solve with the help of counters borrowed from their mother's workbox. As children grow older, they can go on to secondary work by correspondence or to an ordinary school in one of the larger centres. With their early training in application and personal responsibility, they not only hold their own with other pupils, but are frequently ahead of the class. Each week, as the pupil's work comes back to the school, it receives the sympathetic and careful attention of the teachers. They keep a detailed record of the progress of every child, how regularly he sends in his work, how well he carries out the work assigned to him. There are notes, too, on his special characteristics, whether he's tidy or imaginative, his humour and his difficulties. Teachers are interested in every child's development, and the comments they make on corrected work become very real and personal messages to the children of the art back. You are making good progress, Belinda. Keep on improving and soon you'll be my best pupil. Composition and drawing are good, but try to improve the setting out of your work. Very good sentences, Helen, dear. Be sure you practice your sums. Lessons are related to the needs of everyday life. Children draw pictures of the things they see around them, and teachers get to know the homesteads and the country, the pets on the farm, through the eyes of the children. Good work by small children is marked with an animal stamp, a rabbit perhaps, or a kangaroo. For older children, there is instruction in handwork, cookery, household management, poultry raising and technical subjects. They all learn mathematics, geography, history and English. The pronunciation of French and Latin is taught orally over the radio. Regular broadcasts by teachers from the correspondent schools form another personal link with pupils and their parents. These are important occasions for everyone. When it's time to go on the air, children gather round radios to listen to the voices of their teachers. Many of the sessions are devoted to speech training, one subject which can't be taught by mail. Girls and boys, I'm going to recite to you part of a poem by an Australian, Dorothea McKellar. It's called My Country. And after I've read it, I want you to repeat each couplet after me. Now here is the poem. I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, of ragged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains. I love her far horizons, 
I love her jewel sea, her beauty and her terror, the wide brown land for me. Now then, after me. I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains. I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains. Of ragged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains. Ragged mountain rains of drought and flooding rains. I love her far horizons. I love her jewel sea. I love her far horizons. I love her jewel sea. Her beauty and her terror. The wide brown land for me. Her beauty and her terror. The wide brown land for me. Education has reached the landlocked places of the interior. Children feel themselves members of a school which has classrooms and quadrangles stretching from one end of the continent to the other. Schools in which the desks are hundreds of miles apart. And children learn by reading about the world beyond their horizons. Not only children, but parents too belong to the broad community of school life. Mothers as well as children look forward to mail day when packages come back from school and teachers speak as friends from the pages of exercise books. I'm so pleased to see such an improvement in your work this week. I am drawing. A real little artist you are. Good writing, Pat. Please thank Mummy for the note. Another week's work is ready for posting. Another pupil has added so much to his sum of knowledge. School through the mailbag has brought to the country the same opportunities for learning that exist in the cities. Each year, the roles of correspondence pupils grow longer because parents know that education means more than the knowledge of reading, writing and arithmetic. It means the future of their children, their country and the world. 